Hey, hey, friends, thank you guys so much for tuning in to this online gathering of Redeeming Hope. I'm so glad that you guys are tuning in with us, and I'm so glad that we're able to continue offering this gathering online weekly. Uh, We are continuing in our sermon series called Present, exploring the person, presence, and power of the Holy Spirit. And we're actually exploring the presence of the Holy Spirit over the next few weeks and what that looks like in the life of those who choose to follow Jesus. But before we do that, I want to remind us of our vision. Redeeming who I really want to remind us of why we're here and why we're doing what we're doing. Because it's so easy to just kind of forget and get into a rhythm or a routine, but we always want to keep the vision of our church front and center. Redeeming hope, we exist as a family of faith that follows Jesus and helps others find him by living all of life as missionaries of hope. This means that we want to unapologetically follow the life and teachings of Jesus, but we want to be really open to wherever you might be on your spiritual journey. And so to kind of help us shape a culture of openness and transparency and the ability to ask questions, we have four values that shape everything that we do as a church. So even if you don't identify as a follower of Jesus, you're welcome here. Even if you don't believe the Bible is true, you are welcome here. If you are hurting, you're welcome here. And if you have questions, you absolutely are welcome here. And I'm glad that you're with us if you do have questions. But I also want to give you some ways that you can reach out to us. Um, You can text us at our church number, 931-326-4512. You can email me, josh at redeeminghope.org. You can also join this thing called Discord. You can go to ourhope.cc slash Discord. If you're a part of our church family and you want to be more involved and communicate with others, um, you can do so there. It's like a, a communication app. And once you log in, you just click that link, download the app, um, go to Code of Conduct and hit that little green check mark at the bottom. And that'll get you into our system. And you can talk about, there's a, th- a chat thread for our gatherings to give feedback on this um, online gathering. There's a a chat thread to talk about our Bible reading plan. And if you are a part of a group, you'll actually be added to that group's chat thread as well. And that'll be the primary way that you communicate with your group. And speaking of that, I want to remind us of our rhythm in the season coming out of COVID and growing as a church. So we meet in groups every single week. So we're in person, in groups every single week. And there's a few groups that also are online as well. Uh, we have an online gathering every single week. So this thing happens every week, same time, same place. Uh, We also meet in person once a month at the YMCA. And so that's actually going to be next week, June 6th. We're going to be in person. We do a breakfast and an interactive teaching and interactive Bible study where you can ask more questions there as well. And we also offer Hope Kids at that experience as well. So um, with all of that, uh, we want you to reach out to us if you have questions, if you want to get feedback, make sure to download Discord. Also, If you would like to join in the good work that God is doing here in Clarksville by partnering with us financially, you can do so at redeeminghope.org slash give. You can find us on Venmo at Redeeming Hope. Thank you guys so much again for tuning in with us. Today we're beginning the second part of our series on the Holy Spirit called Present. We are looking at the Holy Spirit's transforming presence within the life of the follower of Jesus and how that presence actually causes real life change. And today we're specifically looking at the presence of the Holy Spirit in his personal indwelling. So the Bible talks about how the Holy Spirit personally indwells us and that's what we're talking about today. So um, if you're in Clarksville and you're watching this, it's more than likely that you've been over to my house at some point in time. Many people have been over to my house for steak dinners, um, but there's certain markers you'll know if I'm home. We've got a garage, so you can't always see if I'm home by seeing if my car's in the driveway, because a lot of times my car is going to be in the garage. So there's certain markers. The first one is my door is more than likely unlocked. Now I might, I probably shouldn't say that online on the internet, so it's permanent, but I'm just going to do it. My door is probably going to be unlocked if you come to my house. Um, Most of the time, if it's in the afternoon, the lights on the front porch are going to be on. And then typically at some point in time throughout the day, if I'm working from home, I'm going to be out on the front porch with a cigar or a pipe. And a sign of my presence typically involves cigar smoke and a friendly wave to my neighbors as they drive past the neighborhood. But uh, my presence in the house, you actually see and notice certain things on the outside of the house that indicate that I'm here, that I'm present, that I am in my house. And as we talk about this idea of presence, presence is vital to understanding the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, you see, the sign of God's presence in the life of a follower of Jesus is a changed life. 
And we are actually changed by the indwelling and then the empowering presence of God's Holy Spirit. And if you remember from when we looked back at this, when we intro the Holy Spirit, there's two words that you always want to keep remembering as about the work of the Holy Spirit. What he does is that indwell and empower. He is in the heart of the follower of Christ. And we're going to look at what that means. But then he's also empowering the follower of Christ to live life differently, to be obedient to Jesus. There's two key words. And actually, I think there's, there's a reason why a lot of people that might have grown up in a church context, that they can be really bitter and angry and challenging to be around, is that they're trying to live the Christian life without being filled by the Spirit because they're not actually Christians. So I think some people assume that they're followers of Jesus, assume they're Christians, because they grow up, they saw Jesus on a flannel graph in Sunday school, or they just went to church all their life, and so they just kind of assume they're Christians, and so they're, they actually feel a pressure to like follow Jesus without the power of the Holy Spirit inside of them. But what we do find is when you choose to follow Jesus, the Holy Spirit immediately comes to live in the heart, in the core of who you are when you choose to follow Jesus. Look with me at the words of Jesus in John 14, 20. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. You see, this personal experience happens where God himself in the Holy Spirit lives within our very essence. He's closer to us than our own heartbeat, and he's indwelling us permanently when you choose to follow him. And then he's also, the Holy Spirit comes in us, present with us, and then he lives to empower us, to actually give us the power of God to live a changed life. You see, the Holy Spirit is the personal power for a holy life. He indwells and empowers the follower of Jesus through contemplative faith and personal obedience. He actually directs us to Jesus. He helps us as we looked at last week. He speaks the truth of God to us and he teaches us about Jesus. This is what the Holy Spirit does as he indwells us while drawing us deeper into the heart of our Father and focusing our hearts centrally on Christ. Our, Our lives begin to wrap around Christ to begin to form around him because of the Holy Spirit. It's kind of like bending us. He's kind of like forming us to be more like Jesus. So today we're looking at this on a very personal and very individual level. And we did that on purpose as we start looking at the presence of the Holy Spirit in the life of the follower of Jesus. That is very personal and it's very central to who we are, right? Now, next week, we very intentionally put this as the next week, is we're looking at the corporate or the expressive work of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit changes us personally, but it's not just for us personally. There's actually a corporate expression. There's corporate change that happens. There's, as you're part of a family of faith, you actually begin to change, and then your community begins to change around you as you follow Jesus. So this idea of God's personal indwelling, his empowering presence, it actually, what we're going to be looking at today, it actually connects with this idea of the temple in the Old Testament. So we're actually kind of looking at the Holy Spirit's indwelling presence in the life of a follower of Jesus through the lens of the temple. So this is our our main point for today, is that the Holy Spirit transforms followers of Jesus into the temple of God in the world, personally indwelling and empowering believers with God's presence so that we can be God's presence in the world. So we're going to just look at three points. The temple is the Holy Spirit's empowering presence in the Old Testament. Secondly, we're going to look at how Jesus builds a new temple, you and me. And finally, we're going to look at the indwelling presence of God. First, the temple was the Holy Spirit's empowering presence in the Old Testament. So let me explain how this idea of the Holy Spirit and the idea of the temple are intricately connected. And I just want to go back and give us a recap of the first few pages of the Bible. See, God created Adam and Eve. They were perfect. They were in the Garden of Eden. And God was fully present with Adam and Eve. There was... No need for the Holy Spirit to indwell them because they were physically with the Father every single day. They were walking with him in the cool of the day in the garden. Every day God would come and walk with them. But unfortunately, there was a crashing and a breaking. There was a fall. We actually ran away from God's presence. We rebelled against God, and God came into the garden to walk with Adam and Eve that day, and they actually fleed from his presence. We ran away from God's presence. But what we see shortly after this in in the text of Scripture, that God chooses a specific people, Israel. And he says, I'm going to be present with these people. And I'm going to bless these people. And then through this people called Israel, all the world will be blessed. So God gave this promise to a guy named Abraham that he's going to have through his generations, 
there's going to form a nation that God's going to be present with. And in this presence with Israel, all the world will be blessed. Now, here's what happens, is that um, Abraham's children are enslaved by Egypt. They're captured in Egypt, and they live 400 years in slavery to Egypt. And then God sends a messenger named Moses. And Moses actually frees this captive nation that he says he was going to be with. He frees them from the clutches of slavery in Egypt. And they are on their way to Israel. They're on their way to the promised land. And that's where we come to this idea of the Holy Spirit and God's presence connected with Israel. So the question is, what is different about Israel? What is going to be different about this nation of Israel that's different than any other nation in the world? Look with me at what Exodus 33 has to say. And the Lord said, my presence, that's that word presence, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And Moses said to the Lord, if your presence will not go with me, don't bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do. For you have found favor in my sight and I know you by name. My friends, this is God's presence with his people is what distinguishes Israel as his people, separate and distinct from all the other nations in the world. And Moses is crying out to God. God even says, I'll go with you. But Moses said, if you don't go with me, please don't let us go from here. I don't want to leave without your presence. The presence of God is so important to Moses. He says, leave us alone in the wilderness. Don't even let us move from this place because we need your presence. That is how we know we are your people. And you see how the cry of Moses, let us have your presence, goes all the way back to the garden. It goes all the way back to Adam and Eve who were present with God, but yet ran away. And the sign of God's people is where God is present. So that there's a question that begins to arise from this exodus of, of Israel from, from Egypt into the promised land. The question is, will God be present with us? So then God actually designs a specific thing. Look with me at Exodus 25 to demonstrate his presence. God says these words, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. This was called the tabernacle. God says, I will give them a physical sign. The tabernacle is essentially like a box about the size of a kitchen table. And in it, it had the stone tablets that God wrote on. It had a few other things in it. And this um, very ornate box was carried by a specific people called the Levites. There's special people. It was a special box. But what that box symbolized was God's presence with his people. It was a physical expression, a physical sign that God's presence would be with them. That was called a tabernacle. It was like a mobile temple, okay? So it was like a temple on wheels, all right? That's kind of what it was. It was actually on poles. They put poles on it, they put it on their shoulders, and they walked around for 40 years in the wilderness with it. But this idea of a tabernacle was like a mobile temple that physically symbolized God's presence with his people. Now, we fast forward. The nation of Israel wanders for 40 years in the wilderness and they come to the land, the promised land. So when they get to the land of Israel, that's the next question is, will God continue to be present with us? Now, there's a bunch of kings that come, that get a rise. There's a bunch of judges. There's a bunch of leaders in Israel's history, but they still have this tabernacle, this, 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 this temporary temple. But look with me at 1 Kings 8 about how where God transitions us, Solomon, one of the kings of Israel, has built a physical building, temple for God. And, at, and he is dedicating this temple. So he's praying to God, dedicating the temple. He says these words, as Solomon is dedicating the temple, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built. Yet, have regard to the prayer of your servant and to his plea, O Lord my God, that your eyes may be open day and night towards this house, the place of which you have said, my name shall be there. The Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he not leave us 
or forsake us. My friends, this is the dedication of Solomon and the dedication of the temple that would be the center, the seat of the Jewish person's interaction with God for a millennia, for a thousand years. It represented this physical building, this temple, represented God's presence, and everybody knew that it did. It was seen universally throughout the whole world that it represented God's special presence with Israel. And so when Israel rebelled against God, their punishment was to be removed from the land and be removed from accessing the temple. It was like God was saying, I'm going to remove you away from your access to me. So that physical temple was really important when Israel was enslaved because they were taken away from their land and taken away from their temple. Now, what happens later is the temple is actually destroyed and it represents God's final departing presence from Israel. He says, I'm done, and that he allows the temple to be destroyed. And we see there's a whole book of the Bible called Lamentations that the author writes as he's watching the temple being destroyed and his heart is broken because it's symbolizing God's presence departing and fleeing from Israel. Now, fast forward to the, to the end of the Old Testament. When Israel repented, when they came back to God, the temple was rebuilt. And it was rebuilt to symbolize that God's presence was coming back again to Israel. And so when we come to the first century, when we come to Jesus, there is a rebuilding of the temple, not to its former glory, but there is a rebuilding of the temple where the Jewish people would meet with God. Now, let me explain what the temple is in the Old Testament. There's three kind of markers of the temple in the Old Testament. First off, it was a physical presence. It was actually a building. You can actually go there today and see where it is and where it was rebuilt. You actually had to go there to get access to God. Second, we see the temple in the Old Testament was a corporate presence. It was God's presence symbolizing his presence with the entire nation of Israel, but it wasn't personal. And so when, when Israel messed up, the nation was removed from presence. So even if there was certain faithful people that were within the nation of Israel, it was a very corporate presence. It wasn't a personal presence. And finally, it was a temporary presence. We see consistently throughout the pattern of the Old Testament is that God's presence could be removed as punishment if Israel sinned or rebelled against God, and that happened quite frequently. We see that the temple in the Old Testament was God's empowering presence to his people. Now, here's what's beautiful, is that when Jesus comes on the scene in the first century, the temple had been rebuilt, right? But the sign of God's presence changed when Jesus came on the scene. First, we see that Jesus refers to himself as the truest temple of God. Look with me at uh, at John 2, Jesus just kicked out the religious elite in the temple. And essentially, these religious elite, they were trying to scam the Israelites by offering for money by, in, by, by saying, hey, we'll, we'll sacrifice on your behalf if you give us money. And they were trying to scam them, right? And so Jesus kicked them out of the temple, and here's how they responded. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? They're essentially asking him, what authority do you have to kick us out of the temple and, st- and to stop scamming God's people? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews had said, it has taken 46 years to rebuild this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body. So Jesus is standing in the temple. And remember, it had been in its glory days. It had been rebuilt. It took 46 years to rebuild it. And Jesus is essentially saying to them, you want to know what authority I have? Well, tear the temple down and build it back up. Now, of course, They didn't know that Jesus was talking about himself, but Jesus is talking about himself. He is the true presence of God. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. He's the true presence of God among his people. He's saying, hey, I'm the temple. I'm coming and bringing God's presence. And you'll know it because when you kill me, three days later, I'll rise from the dead. And that's how you'll know that I have the authority to manage my father's house. Now, that's awesome, right? Like that's just, Cool. And then we see that Jesus then also blows our minds later on. He says in John 14, he says, Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we 
will come to him and make our home with him. My friends, this is a promise of the Holy Spirit. He's in the context in John 14 of talking about the Holy Spirit. And so what he's saying is that the Father's presence, my presence, will make our home in those who love me. The Holy Spirit will dwell inside those who love and follow Jesus. And so wait, we're seeing this now. The presence of God, the home of God on earth, isn't in a physical temple. And it's also not going to be with Jesus simply staying on earth. It will actually be with those who love and follow Jesus. That is how his presence will be present in the world. Now, we fast forward a couple of decades after Jesus teaches this. The early church is forming, right? Paul is writing to correct some errors. There's some conflict in the early church. And he says these remarkable words in 1 Corinthians 3 and 6. He says, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? Do you see the connection between temple and spirit here? This isn't just Josh's crazy box of thoughts. Like there's actually a text of scripture here that connects spirit and temple. He says, you are God's temple and the, the God's spirit dwells in you. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Fast forward three chapters later in 1 Corinthians 6, he says, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you are bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. My friends, we, you and me, if we choose to follow Jesus, we are now the presence of God in the world. How? Because his spirit is indwelling us. He dwells in, within us, within our hearts. His spirit resides in us. He makes us his temple, a real permanent presence within us. Now look with me again at the temple of the Old Testament versus the temple in the New Testament. There's a little graphic that'll come up there. The temple in the Old Testament used to be a physical presence. It used to be a building you have to come to. Now it says that there is a spiritual presence that's within us everywhere, that we actually carry the presence of Christ. He dwells within us through the Holy Spirit who indwells us the moment we choose to follow him. And it is everywhere. It's a spiritual presence. Next, it used to be a corporate presence, right? It used to just be God's presence with the entire nation of Israel. It wasn't personal. But now it is a personal presence. It forms us together as a family. Part of what forms our church together is that God is present within each of us individually. It's the same Holy Spirit that dwells within me that is dwelling within Larry, who's running the slides right now in my living room, right? The Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that's indwelling me is indwelling him. And, and that means that we can actually be unified as we follow the same Holy Spirit. It's not just a corporate presence, but it is a personal presence that brings corporate unity, which we're going to talk about next week. Now, in the Old Testament, the, the, it was a temporary presence. The temple was temporary. We could be separated from it physically. God's presence could be removed as punishment for sin, or even if you just left and were enslaved and, and you were in another nation. But my friends, now God's presence is permanent. God's presence cannot be removed from us because of our sins, because they've already been taken care of. My friends, you are the presence of God in the world because his Holy Spirit dwells within you. Now, the indwelling presence of God is also empowering us. Look with me at Romans 8, 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead now dwells in you, see that word dwells in you, indwelling. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. I think Paul's trying to get the point, the spirit dwells in you right? He says it twice in like a sentence. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. At the end, his spirit who dwells in you, like over and over and over and over again, there is the indwelling power of God's spirit. And he's saying that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead now dwells in you. And part of the fruit of that power is personal piety. It's personal obedience. It's becoming more like Jesus. It's sharing in his life. Galatians 5, which we're going to spend a whole sermon on here in about five or 10 weeks, is going to be talking about the fruit of the spirit, right? It's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. All of that is what happens as we choose to follow Jesus and his empowering presence within us. The 
same power that raised Jesus from the dead allows us to love our neighbor. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead allows us to have joy even when we're feeling like Eeyore sometimes, right? Like this is, this, is, this is God's spirit in us working against our natural inclinations to make us more like Jesus. You begin to look like Jesus and you begin to look like his temple and his presence in the world. Now, this is actually a connection from this previous point where your body is not your own. It was actually talking about sexual purity in that context. In 1 Corinthians 6, it was talking about don't join with prostitutes, don't engage in sexual immorality, but actually because your body isn't your own, it was bought with a price and your body is a temple. And so again, going back to that, we're just gonna put that back up again. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? whom you have from God. You are not your own, for you are bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. You see that? Like It's, it's like you, you are a temple. You are a model. You are the presence of God. And so that's the, that's the motivation. God's grace to indwell us becomes the motivation to live a life that is pure, to live a life that is holy, to live a life that looks like Jesus. Our obedience does something in the world. It allows us to live like temples that God has created us to be. But it's only by grace. It's only by God's power. And it's really, to be quite honest, it's only by God's empowering presence, His Holy Spirit within us, that can give us the power even to obey, to give us the power to walk in purity. My friends, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, God's presence and power in your life can be as close as your own heartbeat. You could experience His security. You can experience his protection. You can experience his indwelling and empowering presence in your life to allow you to live life. You don't have to grit your teeth and work harder, try harder to try to be a good person. Like you can be free and rest because of the indwelling power of God. The same power of God that raised Jesus from the grave can dwell in you if you hear the message of Jesus. You believe that he was present with God for you, that he took the punishment for our rebellion against God and that you need that for you. If you believe that and then you obey by making Jesus Lord over your life, you can have the indwelling, empowering presence of God in your life. Now, if you're joining us and you are a follower of Jesus, that personal indwelling of God's spirit, it can never leave us, right? So we didn't earn it. We can't lose it. It's just that simple. You cannot never become unsaved. If you choose to follow Jesus, you give your life to him. He secures you and his Holy Spirit is part of that seal. But here's the thing. His empowering of you can be limited by your sin or your rebellion. So if you are, the Bible actually talks about this, you can quench the spirit. And we're going to talk about that actually in a few weeks about what that might look like. But it's kind of like this fire. It's like a big fire pit and you can feed it right? And you can grow it. You can pour gasoline on it and it lights and it gives heat, right? Or you can douse it with water. And so sometimes we can, through sin, through rebellion, through personal decisions, God still allows us to make choices to whether we will receive his power on our behalf or not. And so his empowering can be limited by whether or not we submit to God's spirit. But this is why we have groups. This is why we get together weekly. We're in groups where we read the Bible together, we pray together. We talked about um, how the scripture, how the Spirit speaks through the Scripture to us. We talked about that last week, and so we actually have groups that read the Bible together that hold one another accountable to like following the life and teachings of Jesus. And I believe that people are transformed so much more in living rooms than in pews. And so I want to encourage you to like be in a group of people that are following Jesus. This is why we have gatherings. We need to be reminded of this. Remember we talked about last week, the Spirit is exposing truth to us. The Spirit is giving the wisdom of the revelation of God to us, right? And so this, these, these teachings are carefully designed to encourage us and spur us on right? To be obedient to God's spirit, to be receptive to his words to us, to be receptive to his power that he wants to work through us, right? That's why we have groups. That's why we do gatherings. And my friends, this is why I want to encourage every single one of you to be personally obedient to Jesus. Spend time in the word. His spirit speaks to you through these pages. And through these pages, the spirit is speaking to you, right? The spirit and the scriptures work in tandem together. 
You and I need this every day. This is also why I encourage us to pray consistently. Like we are coming to God's spirit and saying, I need you. It's a spirit of humility, a spirit of repentance. This is why we must be in community, both in gathering smaller groups around the table that read the Bible, pray, that are huddling together for warmth so we may go out and be the temple of God in the world, right? But this is also why we need these corporate gatherings that are teaching us consistently about the truth. And by the way, I want you to know, I watch these. Like, I need this message that I'm preaching to you. Like, I don't just do this and roll, right? I I am impacted by this, and then I go back and watch it, and I take notes on myself. It's kind of weird, right? Like, I have the notes in front of me. But like, I actually need this too. My friends, going back to our main point, the Holy Spirit transforms followers of Jesus into the temple of God in the world personally indwelling and empowering believers with God's presence so we can be God's presence in the world. And I want to encourage you as we wrap up today to be God's presence in the world around you, to submit to his spirit, join a group, continue to watch these gatherings. And as you do that, and as you have given your life to Christ, as you follow him, you will find that you become his temple, his presence to the world around you. Thank you very much for watching and have a great week.